And tonight, a woman who has won Brits as part of a band, Fairground Attraction, when they burst onto the scene in the late 80s with an immediate number one, and again winning a Brit in 1997 for her solo work. Uh, from pop to Robert Burns' poetry put to music, Eddie Reader's passion for music is boundless. And I'm delighted to say she's joining us tonight for a very nice natter and always some quality patter. How you doing, Eddie? I'm good, I'm good. So I know you're heading out on quite a big tour late summertime, starting on September 1st in Derry. Yeah, I'm doing a two-week tour of Ireland, do Scotland, some Scottish dates, a three-week tour of England. Right, so continuously playing live, really, from the start of September until mid-October then, uh, which is obviously just something that's in your DNA, starting back in the day when you were busking in the south of France. It sounds very bohemian and blissful, but were you actually able to make a decent daily rate, you know, enough to live off? You know, 50 quid in an hour in Ducky Hall Street when you're, when the dole at the time was £27.50. I think it was pretty... It was pretty outstanding to, to find that people give you money for free, that, which is the way I looked at it. I'm just enjoying myself doing the thing that I do. And I had a guy called Hamish Imlach, who was a, a massive mentor to me. Um, he, he taught me all about nerves and how you talk to an audience and how, you, how you, you, you've got to make yourself equal. You're not less or more than anybody that's listening. You're just part of the of the mm. evening, and that that was a real massive learning uh, lesson for me. That 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 saying, yeah. And and who would you have sort of as you were coming up then, um, before you hit, hit sort of hit the big time as as they would say with with perfect, who would you have looked at who was a successful female artist in in whatever genre and thought, yeah. She's handling it well. She's doing it. She, she, that's what I want to do. Well, certainly, I mean, Joni Mitchell was a massive influence. Joni Mitchell, um, I, I got her records and I just swallowed them up. They paid paradise, put up a parking lot. Put up a parking lot. <laughs> she was so uh, uh, dexterous with her, with her vocal range and then on top of that, uh, some of the lyrics I didn't even understand then. I hadn't even had my first love. <laughs> the, 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 so, I, so I couldn't, I could feel a broken heart, but it was more to do with the, you know, maybe being at school and your pal going away somewhere shopping on a Saturday with some other lassie or something. <laughs> that was the closest I got to broken hearted. But certainly, um, uh, you know, in the charts, we had people like uh, Julie Covington, if you remember. And yeah. Of course, uh, only women bleed and all that. It seemed a bit adult for me still. But then we also had, and I, I, I tell you, there's nothing, um, there's nothing more dr driving force than competition. And Sheena Easton was the same age as me. And my mother kept phoning me going, look at what she's doing. Why can't you do that? <laughs> Phone up Esther Ranson, she'll get it. Mum, I'm going for something much more refined, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's funny. And I mean, and what an amazing trajectory her career went on. It couldn't, you know, talk about <laughs> taking different paths from sort of, you know, was it was it was it a, was that Opportunity Knox or something that she won? I'm trying to remember my. It was uh, the big time. I know that's uh... because my mother would phone me up and go, "Have you watched it? Have you seen it?" You seen... Anyway, so um, I'd be in London in my squat, trying to be dead cool and be <laughs> playing jazz and folk and kind of. And then she, my mum would be phoning me up, going, "Look, that girl's done it. You should do." It. And I'd be like, "Listen, mum, she does different stuff for me." And I always felt like the that the cabaret route. Yes. We all avoided like the plague because we were a bit pretentious, you know. We we all believed that we were doing something far more noble, you know, being in the folk music <laughs> and not having any money and all that. We just we, we were sort of desperate to to sort of play that card. That's nine to five, which got to number three in 1980 for Sheena Easton, who, by the way, is currently on tour in the USA with a recent guest of the evening show, Taylor Dane. Uh, and we'll be returning very shortly to continue tonight's great conversation with our special guest on the evening show, singer-songwriter Eddie Reader. Coming up next. 
Welcome back to the evening show with Jackie Brambles, where it's just you, me, and our special guest tonight, singer-songwriter Eddie Reader, cozying on in for a great conversation. Uh, we were talking before the break, Eddie, about Sheena Easton being a fellow Scottish singer of the same age, uh, but who obviously went on a completely different path. I mean, in many respects, she was the first reality TV star who used that documentary platform to to launch her career from, whereas you were a million miles away uh, from that, busking away on the streets of the south of France to earn your stripes. So where did you see yourself back then in the context of the music scene at that time? Who were your peers as such? I think what was happening then, it was just coming out of punk. So 1980, 81. So we had Kate Bush was a massive influence too. Kate Bush was already cutting it. And um, yeah. And so people like me would be more inclined to, to focus on people like Kate Bush and then Susie Sue and all that. We, I, I adored the way Susie Sue sung and I like the way she put the yodel in and <laughs> uh, it was just great. I, I adored, uh, um, I had a real punk ethic, but I was still a hippie as well. It's kind of punk hippie. Punk hippie, good, good, good combo. Dear Prudence got to number three in 1983 for Susie and the Banshees, greatly admired by tonight's special guest, Eddie Reader, right? That was what we had at the end of, uh, in the beginning of the 80s, we had the remnants of, um, what was it called when the altered images came and all that? It was all a bit more... Oh, like kind of, yeah, the new romantic new romantic, sort of, yeah. And yeah, also, yeah. I'd gone to France. So I went to France to Bosque and I, st- I spent six months in Paris busking at the Saint-Michel, and then we went all the way down to the south of France with this kind of circus bunch of people, fire eaters and jugglers, and we ended up down there for the for the next year. And tell us a, bit, a little bit about the art of busking. You must you must have really figured out, you know, what were the money makers, what were, what were the songs that people reacted to best and in what situations. And I, I often wonder that when you do see people busking on the streets, some seem to be coining in and some seem to have that rather empty sparse bleak sort of guitar case open and not not much going on what would your advice be to Ah, the buskers what well i mean i'll tell you right now that what i discovered was when i was feeling i had to do it and i i didn't have any money for breakfast then i never made anything but Mm. not much but it was only when i went there with this sort sort of attitude of i'm going to have fun and i'm going to really enjoy this today I just seemed to attract coins and um, there was a, there was a, I just think there was an old man I met in, in, in a campfire down in the south of France and he just said, as long as, as long as you enjoy every moment, you know, you, you'll always be all right. You'll attract the light, you know? So, yeah. um, so that's, that's what I, my advice is to everyone. And when I meet people and they say, oh, I can't get a record deal. I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that. It's all right for you. You had the chance. I go, no wonder you haven't kind of got anywhere because you're you're so bitter about it all and and you're not enjoying it. You're not enjoying the process, and part of the process is rejection and and yeah. surviving on a fiver. You know, part of it is kind of figuring it out that you love it more than you love the fiver. Oh, great advice. Uh, so so when you eventually returned to the UK, then from France, had the music scene changed much? So when I came back. Punk had kind of happened and um, the folk scene had died and number one was Don't You Want Me Baby. And I remember thinking, who are these guys? You know, because I had no trajectory with them because I'd yes. gone to another country and, and just got lost in last in France, as Bonnie Tyler would do. <laughs> Number one in 1981 with Don't You Want Me, Human League. So did do you feel that because you did really, you know, pay your dues and, and learn your chops uh, in the folk clubs, in the busking, uh, in the ba- various sort of incarnation of bands that you were a, that you were a part of, that when that, you know, hit chart, mainstream chart success arrived in the shape of Fairground Attraction uh, with, with the track Perfect, were you ready for it? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I must have been because it came, but um, I certainly think that 
uh, emotionally, I, I, I would deal with things a little bit more differently now. You know, there was things that, that I was kind of allowing to happen. I, I was still a little good girl from Glasgow, you know, a big Glasgow family. And I, you know, I, I, I've learned to doff my cap at anybody with a posh accent for so many years that, um, you know, doctors and teachers. So when I got to London and everybody spoke like that, even if I, even if I had a, you know, even if they had a Cockney accent and no money, I, I still thought they were posh. So I would be like, <laughs> oh yeah, you want me up at six in the morning to do 15 million interviews? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I'll do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you don't want me to wear this. Oh, you don't want me to say that. Oh, you don't want me to sing that. I was kind of a bit too people pleasing and I really wanted to enjoy it. And I think yeah. that came across. So for the for the time that I had it, which was very brief, I, that moment, those moments, that album, uh, the first of a million kisses, with Mark Nevin and Roy Dodds and Simon Edwards, I think that they captured me at the moment where I wasn't really paying attention to all that, and I was just enjoying it. I don't want half-hearted love affair. That's perfect. Number one for Fairground Attraction in 1988. And we will be back with more great conversation from our special guest on the evening show tonight, Eddie Reader. That's next. Greatest Hits Radio, Jackie Bramble's with you on the evening show along with our special guest for tonight's great conversation, the wonderful musical artiste Eddie Reader. Of course, first known to us as the lead singer with Fairground Attraction before embarking on a solo career. Um, so before the break, Eddie, we were talking about when you were in Fairground Attraction, you had that number one straight off the bat with Perfect. Suddenly, you know, you're on top of the pops. Everybody knows who you are. You can't go anywhere without being recognised. And just my own observation of musicians who've gone through that very sudden introduction to being very, very well known publicly is that no sooner have you come to terms with being hugely successful and famous, then there's this enormous follow-up pressure from the industry side of things to somehow maintain that level of success, which is all but impossible. I had no idea what I was playing with. You know, I, we all were signed to a deal forever and ever and we all had to, we couldn't get out of it unless we provided the record company with something. And I had no way of, I, honestly, if I could have given up then in 1990 and just, you know, tried to get another career, maybe, I don't know what I would have done. Seamstress, maybe. I, <laughs> but um, I, I, I just, you know, uh, I remember going to the record company with my first album, Mer Mama, and they kind of went, well, no, it's not for us. And uh, that oh. was it. All, all that work and all that pressure and I and it had gone. It was like, forget it. So and then luckily Jeff Travis came along and, and signed me to Blanco y Negro and gave me I think they paid my mortgage for about four years. Oh Warner Brothers. So that was good. They just kinda of, kind of kept, gave me a stipend every month and gave you the space. I looked after my babies, yeah. During that very intense time then when you're being pulled in a million different directions and there's this huge push to wring every last drop of energy out of you whilst you're still riding high in the public eye and the charts with lots of crazy demands on you. Did you find yourself sort of in a very small club, a kind of a, a peer? A, did you have peers at that point that you could talk to and go, my record company had been a nightmare. They want to go, they want me to go out busking and it's five in the morning. And I'm afraid, how is your record company? <laughs> was, there, was there that little coterie of camaraderie? Well, there were a couple of people who were lovely to me. Uh, Thomas Dolby was one, very supportive. J Jules Holland himself, very supportive. Um, and Alison Moye, who became an angel to me. She came uh, when the band had split up. She came to my house. She took the baby off me and said, and I had another four-year-old, so she said, go upstairs and have a bath. <laughs> <laughs> Just go upstairs, have a bath. And, I mean, they knew it. They knew that it was a lot of pressure. Alison Moyer got to number four in 1987 with that beautiful track, Love Letters. Uh, but she was always the top of our guest, Eddie Reader's charts, when it came to babysitting and just being a good pal. Uh, so so back then, Eddie, when you were a working musician whilst trying to raise a very young family, 
Did you have any sense of the odds of of having a long term career being stacked against you because you were a woman with an awful lot to juggle? I think what you have in your head, it really counts for a lot. And what I noticed was that my my work, my creative work, mm. was on a par with anybody that would, you could put in front of me. I could definitely sing and write and get lost in the creative process just as equally as any man. But what I did notice, which might be different now as I look out of my window and I see a lot of men with their baby buggies and, and backpacks with kids in them. So I do think, I do think in the long term, if you look at the trajectory of it, we are balancing it out now. I mean, I see men now with prams and and buggies and my husband himself in 1991 was like that but certainly um, it was it wasn't as common as it is now and I'm I'm so proud of of guys and women that are bringing up these boys to know that they have to equal responsibility to to this this baby that they've created yeah well said well from one type of collaboration raising kids to another musical collaborations uh, have always been a part of your story. Obviously, you have a long-term connection with Jules Holland, performing often with him and his band. And didn't you also last year perform with Steve Harley and Cockney Rebel? They asked me to come and play at the Armadillo and play in Milton Keynes with them. Um, what a thrill. I was just perving over Stuart Elliott, who <laughs> I, I had his poster on my wall. That was the drummer of Cockney Rebel. He was there on stage. And Steve himself is such a genius lyric writer. Um and watching the crowd just dance to come up and see me make me smile. So that was my recent, most recent beautiful collaboration that I have enjoyed. You've done it all. Make Me Smile, number one in 1975 for Steve Harley and Cockney Rebel. Uh, so we're almost out of time, Eddie. And, and at this point, we always look to our special guest to select our final track. So how about the song um, that unfailingly uplifts you, inspires you, comforts you? You can put it on whether you're in a good mood or, or you need, you know, a little bit of a lift and it always does the job. Oh, there's millions of them, but definitely, I I think for everybody to to hear it is uh, Louis Armstrong's um, "I See Trees of Green." Oh, what a wonderful world! Yeah, go on, give us a little burst. Uh, I see them bloom for me and you, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Number one in 1968, What a Wonderful World by Louis Armstrong and what a wonderful track to close out an hour of great conversation. Eddie, thank you so much. Thanks for talking to me. Thank you. Bye. Eddie Reader, big tour of Ireland, Scotland and England starting September 1st right through till mid-October. She is absolutely wonderful live. I do highly recommend snagging yourself a ticket.